Kia ora, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Nikki Freed. I am a researcher at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. I also run the University of Auckland's core genome sequencing facility called Auckland Genomics. However, today I will be talking about work that I did while I was a senior lecturer at Massey University last year. And this is work in which we developed a method which we call the midnight panel or midnight method for rapid and inexpensive whole genome sequencing of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. <clears throat> so before I really launch into the, the details of how we do the genome sequencing, I just wanted to briefly um, touch on what genome sequencing is, why it's important. I think most people understand this at, at this point in the pandemic. However, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. So this is a diagram from the New York Times. Um, the outer circle here represents the genome of the virus. So SARS-CoV-2 has a, it's a single-stranded RNA genome. It's about 30,000 nucleotides long. And this inner circle here represents just the virus itself. So when I talk about sequencing the genome, I'm talking about trying to sequence that entire 30,000 nucleotides. And the reason why we do this is that, as most people know, the virus changes and mutates over time. Certain mutations fix. This is, again, an image from the New York Times of the alpha uh, variant of concern, or B117. So you can see here there are lines sort of coming out from the center circle, and those indicate non-synonymous mutations, so changes to the nucleotide sequence that have changed the amino acid sequence, which may be functionally important. So these lines indicate mutations that have happened that have fixed in this alpha variant of concern, All right, and there are also um, some deletions shown here as well. So you can see that changes um, occur throughout the genome. Also not shown here, are uh, there are a large number of synonymous mutations as well, so changes to the nucleotide sequence. So it is important to sequence the entire 30,000 nucleotides to really capture all of the changes that have happened to the virus over time. So when we talk about sequencing, that's what we're doing. We're sequencing the whole 30,000 nucleotides. So why do we do this? Why do we sequence the genome? Why is that important? Well, it's important to, as I mentioned, track the emergence and the frequencies of these variants of concern. I think know most people right now, Delta has spread throughout the world. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Sequencing the virus also allows us to understand how it evolves. So what mechanisms of mutations are occurring, things like that also allows us, especially in the New Zealand context, so I'm located in New Zealand, we use real-time genomic sequencing to help us track local outbreaks and understand transmission, transmission events. So this is a slide from covariance.org. This is a website run by Emma Hodcroft in Switzerland. And basically what this site does is it takes, um, it accesses GSED, which is a global data repository which um, currently has about 4 million COVID or SARS-CoV-2 genomes, um, which has been running since the beginning of the pandemic. So what this website does is it allows you to look at, for different countries around the world, the frequencies of these variants of concern. And as you can see here, this is just um, one of the one of the plots that uh, I've pulled from covariance from, for the US. And you can see that Delta has rapidly fixated and become dominant in the US and is now actually dominant globally. So by sequencing the genome, we can track the frequencies of these variants of concern and understand what's happening in that space. Oops, sorry. So as I mentioned, in New Zealand, um, we use real-time genomic sequencing to help us track outbreaks. You may recognize this is our Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, speaking with Jop de Ligt from ESR, who's one of the scientists involved in um, collating all of the data from New Zealand. And he's explaining to her, and they're discussing the phylogeny of um, the SARS-CoV-2 sequences that were present in New Zealand at the beginning of the pandemic. So I'll talk a little bit more about how we use that sequencing and why that's important. So we've also written a paper on this. This is, um, if you're interested to, 
to understand more about how you can use genomics to track uh, disease outbreaks. We've written a paper on that in Emerging Infectious Diseases, so that's available if you're interested in that. My role was primarily in developing the method for um, rapid real-time genomic sequencing, so that's what I'll be talking about today. And before I begin that, I just want to give a little bit of background. So our method that we developed is really built on what's called the Arctic method. So I'm going to give a little bit of a timeline, describe a little bit about the Arctic method, and then talk about how our method is um, has modified and made two big modifications to the um, this method. So in January, early January of 2020, the first full genome of SARS-CoV-2 was released. This was um, achieved by doing metagenomic sequencing, which is um, not the most efficient way to sequence the genome for routine sequencing. So January 23rd, so 11 days later, Josh Quick and the Arctic Network released a method for, which is called the Arctic method, for amplifying the virus and then sequencing it using nanopore sequencing. So this is incredibly fast and they have a long background in um, the Arctic Network is heavily involved in tracking disease outbreaks such as Ebola, Zika virus, et cetera. So they were very um, poised to do this work and they did an excellent job. And I would say um, the majority of sequences around the world are probably produced using this method. So the way in which the Arctic method works, I'll give a little bit of background here. So they, here um, at the top of the screen, you can see another um, graphical representation of the genome. So again, it's a 30,000 nucleotide uh, RNA genome. So the first stage, if you want to sequence the whole genome, is to do a reverse transcription. So it's a little bit easier to sequence uh, DNA than RNA. So first step is changing that RNA genome into cDNA. Sorry about that. <clears throat> the next step is to do a multiplex PCR. So in two different pools, um, you can use a tiled amplicon approach so that there are no overlapping amplicons. So in pool A, um, every other, basically um, the Arctic method uses this tiled amplicon approach so that there, um, you amplify the genome in 400 base pair segments that are um, not overlapping, essentially. So this takes, it uses 196 primers and creates about 98 amplicons to amplify the entire genome. So at this stage, you have two pools um, and you can combine those pools and then sequence them either using Illumina chemistry or Oxford nanopore chemistry. So today I'm gonna focus more on the Oxford nanopore sequencing um, because that's the method that we use in the midnight method to sequence um, to sequence SARS-CoV-2. So right now I'm going to give a little bit of background if you're not familiar with nanopore sequencing, just to describe what nanopore sequencing is. I always leave this slide in for my my kids. Love the slide. <laughs> um, so nanopore sequencing has been around. We've been using it for microbial genome sequencing since about 2017. Um, it's a portable real-time sequencer. You can see it fits in your hand. It's a min ion, not a minion. Um, basically, in a nutshell, <clears throat> so, well, now it comes in a range of different devices. So you can see the original min ion is here, and there's now a grid ion and Prometheus ion and um, different sort of range of devices that will deliver um, different amounts of data. And I always like to remind myself to say, you know, I'm not affiliated or paid by nanopore sequencing or by Oxford nanopore at all. Um, I've just been using the technology for a long time, and I'm a big fan. So some of the key attributes of nanopore sequencing are that it's a long read sequencer. So you basically, the length of DNA that you put into the sequencer is the length that you will sequence. So you people have you know gotten single reads over a million or even actually now four million base pairs long in a single read. Typically, we, achieve about five to 50,000 base pair median read lengths. So at its heart, it's a long read, long read sequencing device. It directly, sequenced native, it directly sequences native DNA and RNA. And by directly sequencing the native uh, DNA or RNA, you can detect base pair modifications. So if you're interested in epigenetics methylation, um, it detects 5-methylcytosine, 5-methyladenine, and other, other modifications. 
So these things I've just described um, are not so critical for SARS-CoV-2 sequencing. However, the next two, the ones with the little star, so the fact that this is a portable sequencer, like I said, the MinION plugs into um, your laptop or even a small like iPad uh, device. There are no overhead costs. So as opposed to Illumina sequencing, you don't have to purchase a large sequencer that can cost uh, you know, $100,000 or more. You basically just pay for consumables only. Also, what's really nice about nanopore sequencing is it doesn't require a lot of expertise to use. Um, you need some background in molecular biology, but it's, um, it's fairly robust. It also, what's important for our method for sequencing SARS-CoV-2 is it sequences in real time. So we were really focused on um, making sure that the method that we used was really rapid. And so that's one of the key attributes of why, we're, uh, why we use nanopore sequencing. Okay, so for many people who aren't that familiar with nanopore sequencing, the first thing that they ask is, oh, I don't know, I've heard it's not very accurate. So what about the accuracy? So it is nanopore sequencing has improved accuracy significantly um, over time. I think they are achieving single read accuracy at around 98.3%. So if you're familiar with quality scores from Illumina, that's around the quality score of 18. However, consensus read accuracy is really uh, very accurate. So over 99.999%, which is over a quality score of 40. So this is very comparable with Illumina um, sequencing. So if you, so what I mean by consensus read accuracy as well is if you sequence the same molecule, say 30 times or 50 times, then you can have a very high level of accuracy. And also there are papers. So James Ferguson has done, this is a little tweet from him in December of 2020. Um, th there are people who have benchmarked nanopore sequencing against Illumina sequencing for SARS-CoV-2 and have shown that you they're, they're comparable and that you can clearly call SNPs with nanopore sequencing. So this is um, a good way to sequence SARS-CoV-2. Okay, so coming back <clears throat> to the Arctic method where you have your SARS-CoV-2 genome amplified in these 400 base pair fragments. You've, in this case, we're gonna choose to use nanopore sequencing. What the Arctic method does is they use a ligation kit from Oxford Nanopore. Details here aren't too important. Um, what I've circled here is the time it takes. So this process of ligating the barcodes on and the sequencing adapters so that you can put your that amplified DNA onto the minion sequencer or, or a nanopore flow cell. It takes around 135 minutes and it requires um, some pretty expensive third-party reagents. Um, so this is fine if you're an experienced user and have time, but it is a little bit um, difficult for people who aren't very experienced. However, it does work fine, so it's great. I just wanna highlight that because that is a, a change that we've made to, to our method. Okay, what is also great is the Arctic Network has um, developed software for real-time sequencing analysis. So this is called Rampart. So this is a software tool. So as I said, when you're sequencing with nanopore sequencing, you add your DNA to the flow cell and data starts being written almost immediately. So what this software does is in real time, as you start sequencing, it will create a coverage plot for you. So this, it's hard to see, but these little peaks on the left in blue, illustrate coverage plots of the genome. So you can see in real time, how much data you've collected and if your entire genome has been sequenced to say 30X coverage or 50X coverage. It also does real time phylogenetic analysis. So it will tell you um, which variant of concern you have for which sample. So this is a really um, great tool to use because it allows you just to collect the amount of data that you need. And at that stage, once you've achieved the amount of data that you want, say 100X coverage of all of your you know, 12 or 25, 24 genomes, then you can actually turn the flow cell off, wash it, and use it for something else. So in that way, it, it helps save money as well and time. So you can finish sequencing um, 
just you can finish sequencing once you've um, collected the amount of data that you need. <clears throat> so some of the initial results. So when we started, um, as I mentioned, I started looking into developing a method for uh, SARS-CoV-2 genome sequencing in about March or April of 2020. And so at this time, the Arctic method um, had, had already gone through a couple iterations of their primer scheme. So as I said, in January, Josh Quick, 11 days after uh, the first genome was um, released, Josh built this version one of the primer sequences. So this is an example of, of coverage plots, I should say. So on the x-axis, we have the SARS-CoV-2 genomic location, and on the y-axis is the coverage. And you can see in these pink bars at the bottom here, you can see that there are dips in coverage. So some amplicons just failed to amplify. However, for a completely you know, untested, um, so they released this without actually testing it on real samples. At this stage, they didn't have a real sample. So just for an in silico um, method of testing, this worked really well, to be honest, the first time. I think Josh describes this as a bit of a primer whack-a-mole, I've heard him say. So because version one, there were a few primers that didn't work, they developed a version two primer. And while some primers um, were, you know, they could fix some of the primers at the same time then other primers dropped out. So they then developed a third version of the primers, and this is um, one that's been in use for a long time. They've just recently released a version four. Um, however, at the time that we started doing this, we had access to version three in March of 2020. And at that stage, you could already see that there were some um, significant there is significant variance in the amount of coverage that can be produced with the version three of the primers. You'll see on the left, or sorry, on the right here, this is a log scale. So there is a good amount of variance in the coverage. So when we were looking at how we could possibly improve this or use it locally here in New Zealand, we looked at um, redesigning the primers. So that's something that I'll talk about. So, oops, sorry, Turn the wrong thing. So what I'll be talking about today is the midnight method, which is the method we that we use. So it's a built off the Arctic method, and it really just makes two modifications to the Arctic method, and that's had a um, significant impact on the ability for us to get better coverage and um, produce sequence data faster. So the two sort of modifications that we made were to change the amplicon length. So we made longer amplicons. And that enables us to get um, more even coverage of the genome. This also, by making the amplicons longer, that means that we use fewer primers. And the idea here was to produce less cross reactivity. So there's less um, chance for those primers to cross react. And potentially that means that there'll be fewer dropouts. Also, having fewer primers as the virus um, changes over time there's less of a chance that the primer will mismatch with the genome. So you'll have less dropouts, um, potentially fewer dropouts. However, um, one drawback there is that if you do have a dropout with longer amplicons, you will lose more sequencing data. So there's a bit of a trade-off by choosing to use longer amplicons. However, these primers have held up fairly well um, against most variants of concern that we see now. Another modification that we made was to use Oxford Nanopore's Rapid Library Prep Kit. So this is a much faster, um, cheaper, and easier to use kit. At the time that when we were developing this, there were only 12 barcodes available. They have since released 96, so that allows us to do many samples at once. Um, so those are, I'm going to talk about those two modifications a bit more in detail. So we initially tested three different primer sets. Um, we tested a 1,200 base pair primer set, a 1,500 base pair primer set, and a 2,000 base pair um, primer set, which creates longer amplicons. So at the time when we did this, we didn't know if any of these would work. Um, so we gave a shot and tried three different ones. And we use a multiplex PCR, a very similar method to uh, the Arctic Network's um, 
the way in which they do their multiplex PCR. So again, it's a tiled amplicon approach where you have non-overlapping segments of the genome amplified in two different pools. The next modification that we made was to use the, lap, the library prep from Oxford Nanopore, as I said, which is called the RAPID kit. This is the RBK10-1110 or the RBK004 kit from Oxford Nanopore. Again, um, don't want to get into the details too much, but basically this is a transposon-based method. It's a much faster kit to use, so approximately 10 minutes of um, prepping that DNA to put on the flow cell as opposed to 135 minutes. It also requires far fewer third-party reagents, so it just requires ampere beads. Um, so that makes it less expensive as well. And given the fact that there are fewer pipetting steps, it is less prone to, you, you have fewer chances of making a mistake or contaminating um, your samples. Okay, so these are our results. So you can see here we tried uh, the top red bars. These are coverage plots of using these different primer sets. So we started, we compared to the 400 base pair version three Arctic primers um, using that rapid transposon base kit. And then as I said, we tested a 1200 base pair primer set, 1500 and 2000 base pair set. You can actually see that they all work okay. So for each, um, for each primer, we initially tested two different um, patient samples, SARS-CoV-2 COVID positive patient samples at different CT values. So it's, it's a little bit hard to see, but the top one is um, a CT of 20 and the bottom one is a CT of 31. And you can see that generally speaking, the primers all work pretty well. We chose to go with that 1200 base pair primer set. This is where we get the name Midnight actually is um, 1200, we thought. It's sort of a little bit like uh, midnight or noon, so we use that name. So that 1200 base pair primer set actually gave the best coverage. It was the most even coverage, and it sort of is that sweet spot of not being too long, so that if the RNA was degraded in any way, um, we felt that if the sequence was too long, then maybe that degradation might not work very well. So we stuck with the 1200 base pair. However, the primers are also available. Um, as a backup for anyone who wants for a 1500 or 1200 base pair, sorry, 1500 or 2000 base pair sequences. Okay, so some more of our results. Um, again, this was um, published in the paper that we um, produced in May 2020. So we just tested very simply five different patient samples at um, high to low copy numbers. So the CT, if you're, if you're not familiar with CT values, that's um, cycle threshold number, so it just gives an indication of how much viral copy there is. So a CT20 is fairly high viral copy number, and as you move down to the blue um, coverage plots, you can see this is at a CT31.2, which has relatively low copy number, and you still get complete coverage of the genome. Um, so this primer set worked pretty well at a range of different viral concentrations. Um, actually, Oxford Nanopore has released other data, so I've adapted this figure from them. They have tested um, ha sort of the limit of detection of getting a full genome from um, using twist RNA control. So this is a sy synthetic, um, synthetic version of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and they took, um, basically diluted it down, and you can see that around 1,000 copies to, um, well, around, at around 1,000 copies, most of your genomes have full coverage of high quality um, coverage. And usually, it's fairly easy to get um, a good quality genome when you have a CT value under 30. If you go above 30, it can be difficult. Above 35 is very, very difficult to get a full quality genome in our experience. Um, so usually that correlates to around a thousand viral copies. So it has to get a full genome. There's less sensitivity than your standard um, uh, qPCR, which only needs a very very small piece of uh, RNA to get it to work. So the limited detection for genome sequencing is um, it's a little bit higher than uh, for just standard qPCR. Okay, 
and this is actually true, I would say, going back, this is actually true for most methods used for sequencing the whole genome. Most methods have a very similar sort of limit of detection, and that's around 1,000 viral copies or CT values um, under 30, I would say. So again, what, this is a, another figure I've adapted from Oxford Nanopore. This just shows how much time it takes to sequence 96 genomes at 200x depth. So that's a, a very, that would produce a very high quality genome. And you can see right around seven hours um, is enough time to get uh, almost 100% of your genome fully sequenced. Um, so usually we say actually, you know, you can prepare the DNA sequence if you have under 12 samples you can just run the sequencing for an hour and get very high quality genomes for those 12 samples. So this, I just want to highlight this because this is much faster than um, you can get Illumina data. So for Illumina, you have to wait until the entire sequencing run is finished before you can look at the data, and that can take at least 24 hours. So nanopore sequencing actually enables you to sequence for a much shorter amount of time, yet still get high quality genomes. So that in a New Zealand context, we have used that um, to our advantage, and that's a really important part of our COVID response is getting sequences in um, almost in relatively real time. Okay, so just to summarize, um, midnight method for SARS-CoV-2 genome sequencing. So by changing the primer sets, we've gotten better coverage, more even coverage. That means we can collect less data, and it also means that you can get full the full SARS-CoV-2 genome faster. So this enables you to save time, um, save money, and um, it works pretty well. Changing the library prep method results in significantly cutting on the hands the hands-on time. So from two hours over two hours down to about 15 minutes of hands-on time just to um, do that library prep. There are fewer pipetting steps, so thus this can reduce errors. You can use robotics to totally automate the library prep. It's less expensive because there are no third-party enzymes that are needed. Um, currently, Nanopore sells this as a complete kit. So you just purchase the kit and you can get all the reagents that you need in one. This enables us to do sample to data upload in a single working day. So we can get the RNA into the lab and in less than seven hours, you can produce full genome sequence. Um, uploaded, like a complete assembled genome uploaded. And actually the longest part of that is just the PCR step, which takes three and a half hours. This is a field deployable kit. It really doesn't take a lot of expertise. Um, it's quite flexible in the amount of input DNA that you put in. So it doesn't need, to, you don't need to be very precise when you use it. Um, so this has worked out pretty well. If you want more information, um, we published a paper that details um, a little bit more information about this method um, in uh, biology methods and protocols. The method is also available, as, and also this um, biology methods and protocols, this is the open access paper. Also open access, we published the method on protocols.io. So if you want a detailed method of exactly how to do it, it's here. It, this has over 20,000 accessions already, so a lot of people have been looking at this and using it. So in terms of New Zealand, the Midnight Method has had a pretty big impact in how we, um, how we use our COVID response. So for all emergency COVID sequencing, the Midnight Method is used. Um, in New Zealand, we've been very lucky. We've had very limited community spread of COVID-19. So whenever a case appears in the community, there is a um, desire to get the sequence, se the genome sequenced immediately, so we can better understand how the person got infected and where that um, where that infection might have happened. So for a while, we were working for the government. This has now been transferred to a um, to ESR, which is a central um, agency that does this. But <clears throat> when we were contracted by the government to do the sequencing. We are under contract to produce the uh, genome sequences in less than 24 hours, and we typically could do this in under 10 hours. And that also includes the time to do the RNA isolation. And you can see there are some images here on the on the right from headlines 
our media and as well as the government has been really, um, they've really embraced the science and they've really uh, used the rapid genome sequencing to um, help in our testing and our tracking of outbreaks. So this has um, been really neat to see this embraced in New Zealand and used in an um, everyday context to make, um, to make policy. So globally, the midnight method um, has also had a significant impact. IDT sells the midnight primers um, as a pre-mixed pool. So you can purchase it. So you don't need to mix all the primers yourself. Um, they're also working on optimizing the primers to balance them a little bit more even. So you get more even coverage. Um, IDT has sold this, these pools to over 180 organizations in 35 countries. And you can sort of see from their website, um, they have a little button, you can learn a little bit more about that. And as I alluded to, Oxford Nanopore, sorry, Oxford Nanopore has released the Midnight Method as an official recommended protocol. So you can see on their website, um, they have, you know, how, what approach should I use to sequence the genome? They have both the Midnight Method and the Arctic Method, and you can see They've sort of outlined that you need little experience compared um, to the Arctic method. So Midnight method requires little experience, uses very little third-party reagents. It is a rapid prep method, and it has a quick turnaround and a low cost per sample as compared to the Arctic method. Actually, in Oxford Nanopore last, oh, about two weeks ago, have released um, a high throughput kit using the midnight method for SARS-CoV-2 sequencing. So they have really taken the method and um, scaled it and packaged it. And so it makes it much easier for researchers to just buy one kit, get all the reagents they need, and they can do the sequencing themselves. And we've actually seen that this is being used. I have a lot of people who've contacted me from developing countries with not a lot of infrastructure, and they're using nanopore sequencing with our kit to um, sequence a lot of genomes. So this is really good in terms of helping the global community understand variants of concern in across the world, so globally. So I, I'm really a big fan of nanopore because it really enables the democratization of sequencing. You Places that weren't able to um, sort of have access to a lot of funding can still do this method. So this is again from the Oxford Nanopore website. Um, it takes about seven and a half, seven hours, 15 minutes to um, produce a genome from RNA. You can do thousands of samples. Um, it's approximately, if you multiplex and you do a lot of samples on one flow cell, you can get the cost down to around $9.55 per genome which is a very good price, US dollars. Um, so this is really exciting for us to see the Midnight Method being used globally, and Oxford Nanopore has really facilitated that. Um, you can also use the Midnight Method. So once you amplify the genome using the Midnight Primers or the Arctic Primers, um, you can use it, as I said, for Illumina sequencing. Um, PacBio is another sequencing chemistry, another long read sequencing chemistry. So PacBio also uses the midnight primers for SARS-CoV-2 sequencing. It's the only um, method that they have up on their website. So that's been um, some impact there. Sorry, let me, I'm having a problem with the slides. There we go. Okay. Um, if you would like to use the midnight primers with Illumina sequencing, several places have also developed um, basically transposon-based methods for um, taking the midnight from amplified SARS-CoV-2 genomes with the midnight method, you can then use um, transposon-based methods to shear it down to a size that's more amenable to Illumina sequencing. So SeqWell is one of the places that has done that. So you can go to their website and use their method for um, preparing this DNA for Illumina sequencing. IDT also has a kit. They have what's called a Lotus DNA library prep kit. It also uses a transposon-based um, method. So they have a method on their website that you can use the midnight panel with their Lotus library prep kit to um, run these samples on Illumina sequencing. So just 
to summarize, um, the Midnight Method builds on the Arctic Method, um, and it works really well for rapid, inexpensive whole genome sequencing. It works well for labs with limited funding if you use nanopore sequencing. Um, and it really has had, I think, a global impact in helping collect um, information and genomic data on SARS-CoV-2 around the world. And none of this would be possible without um, a lot of people's help and work. So Olin Sylander is um, a collaborator who deserves equal credit. I mean, he has done a ton of work on this. Um, Marketa is a PhD student in our lab who's also helped a lot. Um, lab Plus helped us get um, early in the pandemic patient samples that we could use to test this method. James Connell is our biosafety officer who also helped us work with um, inactivated COVID samples in our lab. Um, ESR team, which is our um, the team in Wellington and Auckland who actually now do all of the COVID sequencing for the government, especially Yup De Ligt and Una Ren have been um, really helpful for us in uh, discussing protocols and they've taken our method on board, which is really awesome to see. And all of this work was funded by the HRC, the Health Research Council of New Zealand. We um, obtained a COVID rapid response fund, fund from them and that helped pay for all of this work. Okay, so at this stage, I just wanna say thank you very much. And I can take questions um, through the chat, I think. And um, I welcome any comments or suggestions and feel free to get in touch.